Talk, talk to me. WSRadio.com Welcome to Track Talk, your connection coast to coast and beyond in all the latest news, developments, stake race analysis, and interviews inside the world of thoroughbred horse racing. From California to New York, Florida, and Kentucky, we have you covered. It's post time, live from San Diego, it's Track Talk. And we welcome you from a happy and a sunny San Diego, California on this Saturday. Welcome aboard as we dive into all the racing action from across the country. Actually, that's a lie because we're on vacation, to tell you the truth. We just completed Del Mar in their 36-day meet. Los Al is running. Belmont Park is running today, Tommy D. Uh, Kentucky Downs, where the, the prices are uh, just absolutely huge back there as far as purses. And uh, a closing of Del Mar, which uh, was pretty remarkable in its own right because uh, no racing injuries on the track, euthanizations, solely what we needed. Yeah, nice job, uh, Del Mar. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this big Saturday, college football Saturday, really. Uh, if you didn't tune in to Big Bets, it started at 8 a.m. Big Bet. Big bet. Sorry, big bet. I like the make, bets. We're going to make multiple bets there, <laughs> Felix. So. Big bet, bet, bet. Didn't uh, the Who sing a song like that? Whoever, whenever you bet, whatever the name of the song was, we'll find out. Yeah, we should them. play that. We'll get that okay. in the back mix. But you yeah. got it? Wait, Taylor, you got the bet song from the Who? Maybe, maybe yeah, not. Working on it. All right. He's uh, he's diligently working. Go right ahead. But, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Felix, yeah, we're done with Del Mar, Saratoga. What a great summer overall. Uh, Saratoga, great meet, the handle, Tremendous. Uh, everything. I think around uh, horse racing, you know, definitely got a good positive energy over the summer at Saratoga and Del Mar, and that's what we needed. Uh, we're taking a little bit of break here, but we can't go too far away because right up the road, November 1st and 2nd at Santa Anita, best horses in the world, Felix, showing up, and we're going to be up there. This is the Breeders' Cup, and this is where we got to start looking in, tuning in, uh, looking at races, because it's time to start getting into the Breeders' Cup and seeing what horses are going to show up. And you know that there's a lot of time. Things could happen to these horses uh, from now until November 1st and 2nd. So, you know, watching the horses work out, prepared, talking to trainers, talking to the jockeys, getting that inside information leading up to the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, without any doubt about that, let me tip my hat off to David Jerkins as well as uh, Tommy Robbins, Dennis Moore, uh, Leif Dickinson. Uh, did a tremendous job with uh, the main track and the turf course over there. The good racing five days a week at Del Mar. Great guys right there. I uh, just want to say uh, I'm happy for them because, uh, you know, coming into it and after trickling down from Santa Anita and with all the situations that took place there, uh, we didn't know what to expect, but you could never, ever imagine, Tommy D., you could never imagine in your wildest imagination that Del Mar would go an entire 36 days of racing without a breakdown or a euthanization on that track during racing. Yeah, it's a great job, but uh, hats off to the whole crew. Like you said, Leif Dickinson, we talked to him. And, you know, everything was going great, but he was still on edge when Boy, we talked wasn't to him. he on edge? I mean, he was, he... Uh, this he, was halfway through the meet. I mean, and everything went well, but you could tell that he was like, wow, on funny. top of it. But, hey, great you're, job. You're funny. You know, but when we That's talked right. to him, that, right, he was right. like, oh, uh, hey, you know, nervous. I'd love, oh, to, I'd love a, to talk to you, but yeah. my work's not done. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you. We're doing, you're doing a great job, but he got nervous. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man, please, you know. I gotta, gotta, gotta take it, you know, and I love the guy. I love the guy. I told you that he he was so tuned in. Um, just congratulations all the way around. Saratoga, off the charts. Off the charts handle. Off the charts uh, attendance. You know, the weather hasn't been up to snuff over the last three years at Saratoga. They had a lot of cancellations. They're having off tracks in, at Belmont, which kicked off yesterday. But, boy, I'll tell you what. There is so much, uh, so much to be uh, proud of. And, as you mentioned, the Breeders' Cup down the road. And I'm sure there's some win in your in races today. Give me one race from Belmont Park today. Who do you like? Uh, yeah, so Belmont Park, uh, you know, the later part of the car, there's a couple uh, stakes races, but I like a uh, horse in race number nine. nine. And that's a West Coast horse for uh, Baltus. Number three, Lady Prance a lot. You might uh -huh. have heard this one. This horse finished third in the Del Mar Oaks at 15 to one, and this horse did win the honeymoon. 
Balta ships us out, and Joe Talamo goes to ride. Yeah, so he does. this tells me that this horse is live, nine to two. Other horses that concern me is number five, Love So Deep. This horse is shipping in from Fran uh, France and seems ready to roll nine to two there. And then the favorite morning line is the one, Adisa. But I'm going to take a shot. Number three, Lady Prance a lot. We know Baltus could get it done on the turf. He believes in the horse. Talamo's going out and riding it, so I'm going to take a chance. Number three, yeah, Lady absolutely. Prance a lot. Uh, Good connections there. Richie Baltus, a guest on our radio program last weekend. Joe Talamo uh, could not make it. And so uh, it was funny that you would mention Joe Talamo because driving to the studio, I was going to reach out to him and ask him to join me and you on the radio program this morning. And uh, one of our favorites of all time, Joe Talamo. Uh, we're here in San Diego on this Saturday after Del Mar and Saratoga completed their summer meeting. Uh, we have a little uh, breather, per se, three weeks of Los Alamitos. we got races at Belmont Park as well as Kentucky Downs. And we also got a special guest online waiting to be on the radio with us. It's with pleasure. We have the trainer to the stars. The one and only John Paracella joining us on Track Talk. John, the top of the morning, how are you? Hey, good morning, guys. Everything's good. You're back in New York, Oyster Bay, New York. I'm in, uh, I'm back home uh, from California, and, uh, you know, it's just a great feeling, and uh, I just was ecstatic over the Saratoga meet. It was a boost that we really needed in racing. And Delma, my, my friend David Jerkins as well, I'm so proud of him. He did a great job. So I'm in a good frame of mind after what was going on with Santa Anita. John Paracella, tell us, how did you get involved in thoroughbred horse racing? Um, you know, what, in, what led you to uh, become a trainer and what was do you, who was your most guiding influence that sort of directed you toward the industry? My, my dad was a bookmaker. So he was taking me to the racetrack from the time I was four years old and it kind of never left my blood. And, uh, it was something that, you know, when I went to college, I went for my BBA and I was an auditor in a bank and I lasted like six months. And I was, Ducking out to go to the racetrack, you know, and just getting my ordering work done in the morning. And I said, I have to be a part of this. I mean, it, you know, it's just, it's something that I love so much. And, uh, and so, uh, my father's friend, John Reggioni gave me my first job and I never could afford horse, uh, pay for horseback riding. I grew up in a slum area. So I was afraid of horses. I got fired from my first two jobs. And then I hooked on with uh, Tommy Golo. And then after him, my mentor was Sean Campo, who was breaking every record. And uh, I couldn't wait till the next morning. I was working like 12 to 14 hours a day. And I loved every minute of it. And I owe him everything for what little I've accomplished. Wait a minute, you're confusing me, John. Now, you say that you were afraid of horses, but you wanted to be a horse trainer. Well, because I wanted to be part of the game, and so I first went in hoping that I could put some people together and manage horses. And when uh, I couldn't do that, I couldn't raise the money, then I said, you know what, I I'm going to do my best to become a trainer. And after get firing from my first uh, firing from my first two jobs, it shows you how much I loved it, how relentless I was. And my first job with Go was forty dollars a week, just rubbing the legs of the horse in their stall and not doing anything active. And then from there, I went on to Campbell, and uh, I started sleeping in the stalls. That's how much I loved. John. Paracella is joining us. John, you said your father was a bookmaker, so when he took you to the track, did you see transactions being made as a young boy? Yes, I did, and it, it was incredible because my dad went back, naturally, to the old horse rooms. It wasn't like, you know, uh, on a telephone or something like that, and uh, with the people that were around him, I was, I was a little bit bright, and I kind of caught on so much of it in the game itself. I mean, and then I started gambling when I was like 13, 14 years old. So you, your father would take you to the OTBs? Is that what you're saying? 
No, no, no. Racetrack itself, going okay. back to uh, the old Jamaica racetrack and, you know, then Aqueduct and Belmont and to the racetrack. All right, so now, now let's speed it up here. You're, you, you know, you, all of a sudden you're, you're a, a young man who wants to get involved. And so then what was your, who was your first winner? What year was it that uh, you trained your first winner as a trainer, as the certified official trainer in the program? Who was the horse and what year was it? It was in 1969. The name of the horse was Colonel Bay. It was a $3,000 claiming race, and my father and his three friends put up 1000 apiece, and the win was a 20-minute photo. I'm not exaggerating. It might have been only 10, but it seemed like 20 minutes, and then they put my number up. I'm on the, I'm on the spot. When you start accumulating a lot of business, what was your best year after 69? I'd have to say uh, I was fifth leading trainer after my five-year apprenticeship, my first year in New York, Felix, and I didn't know anything. I just kept running to Campo for help, and I knew the game. I, I was a good game player, but I really wasn't a good trainer yet. I was my fifth, fifth leading trainer. So I wouldn't consider my, my best year would have to have been uh, 80, I want to say 1984 when I had the million dollar contract with Sabarese and I was third in the Preakness. I won championships prior to that. But with, the, with Sabarese, it was like 30, 40%. And it was, a, it, it was an incredible three, four years I spent with him. And I raced at many racetracks. I remember at Delmar, trainers will tell you what they accomplished. I remember when I get beat. I, I lost a grade two uh, with Chapel of Dreams. It was in the 80s. Uh, she was a filly in a grade two stake by a nose. And, and that still lingers with me. We're that joined, was at Delmar. I understand. We are joined with uh, trainer to the stars, John Paracella. He has a, a beautiful book. Uh, out that was written by Denny Dressman out of Denver, I believe, a uh, sports writer there. And uh, The Trainer to the Stars is the name of the book, From the Streets of Brooklyn to uh, Trainer to the Stars, John Paracella's Lifetime of Celebrity Connections. Now, all of a sudden, uh, you decide to uh, come to California. What year was your first invasion into our beautiful state here. I want to say it was like 1972, 73. And uh, uh, Bobby Franklin and I were like, uh, we were compared, you know, we competed against each other because we had a history back in New York. And I was with him when he got fired and then got Willie Frankel. And the rest of him was history. When they went to California, when Bobby wanted to go back to New York, Billy Franklin says, I'm staying in California. And it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened, I'm sure, in his career. And uh, my first win there, I dead heated with him. He naturally had a two to five shot, and I had a 15 to one shot. Went to war, and that was at uh, Santa Anita. When we talk about. Uh, the other Frankel, he was the owner, no relation, as I remember reading that in, in the book. No, and Bobby, there was no relation. Bobby Frankel came out here, and Bobby Frankel essentially was a claiming trainer that uh, built his stable uh, up uh, through the claiming ranks. And I could remember talking with the late Edmund Gann, and Edmund Gann shared with me uh, that uh, he fired Bobby Frankel four or five times, then rehired him. This story goes... Yes, I know that. This story goes really deep. This story, this story goes really, really deep. Okay. Um, it does. It does. I, I'm, I'm just getting a report right now that I just got text that uh, the Oakland Raiders have just released Antonio Brown. So I'm a big Pittsburgh guy, and I, um, I, I you know, Pittsburgh traded him after. Uh, and, 
after his, you know, his behavior uh, during the campaign of the last season and traded him to Oakland. He signed a big deal. And then so this is a, just coming off the wire. Yeah, Oakland Raiders have released Antonio Brown. So let me get back. Let me get back to this story because it's a fabulous book. It's a fabulous book on so many fronts because your memory of remembering all this stuff is unbelievable. Now, you were married to Bobby Frankel's ex. And That's Bo- Bobby Frankel's ex, her name was Bernadette. Bernadette had a daughter named Bethany. And we all know Bethany. If you don't know Bethany Frankel, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> then you've been in a cave because she's the reality star of uh, the the Housewives of New York or whatever it's called. She has her own line, her own brand of different uh, projects and um, I think vodka, sodas, whatever. Any products yeah, and everything so like she, that. She's worth about a 30, 40 million right now. And you raised her. You raised her, Bobby. From and two Bern- years old. From how old? Two. Two. Okay. So in the book, you told me she was a terrible two. Oh, a killer. And how old were terrible you? How, how old were you at that time? At that time, let's see. Uh, I had to be... I, 30 years old, All right. 29, 30 years old. All right, so now now, the mother, Bernadette, works, and you become a very, very close-knit father with Bethany, with uh, you spending a lot of time with her, and you and, she, you and her, or you and she... I raised her, Philly. I know, but, but I know you raised her, but... More importantly, you had a good relationship with her, didn't you? It was incredible. I mean, uh, I spent 50000 on a Sweet 16 party. When she graduated high school, I took her to Europe. I took her to California when uh, I had to do some work out there, and her mom wasn't available, and Bobby wasn't in her life, and lived in Chadsworth. Uh, wherever I went, it was incredible. I, I made sure I was there. Bobby Frankel was a tough guy. He didn't like to be called Bobby either. I mean, uh, he looked at you and he, uh, if looks could kill when you called him Bobby, he liked to be referred to Robert Frankel. And I go back with Bobby Frankel because I've called him Bobby, uh, even if he didn't like it because it was just a nice ring to it. But when I was dishing, no question. When I was a DJ at the distillery in Solana Beach going back to the mid 70s, Bobby Franco would come in. He'd come in with Eddie Naham and his group of people, and I was the disc jockey, as mentioned. And and I got to know Bobby Franco, but never got to know Bobby Franco, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you never could get to know Bobby. Very, very tough. I shared this with you on the phone earlier in the week that I talked with Bobby, and uh, he, he, you know, he was. I interviewed him, and he was just a very tough interview. A very tough interview without any question at all. All right, so now. This had to put some sort of strain between you and Robert Bobby Frankel because now you were married to his ex-wife. And so I could imagine that you guys were buddies at one point. And then in the book, you said you dead heated with a horse at 20 to 1 with Bobby Frankel. And after that, the relationship sort of fell apart because of uh, perhaps the fact that you were with his ex-wife. No question. And so then... No question. And it wasn't... Let me say one thing, Felix. It took over a year before we connected. So it wasn't something where she went from him to me. I I was close friends with her sister, and then I helped out babysitting uh, with Bethany. And, you know, so it wasn't one to another. That didn't exist. But uh, he couldn't accept it. Let me get out of that and go into what I find the most fascinating part of the book. And that is you had a relationship with Joe Pepitone and Mickey Mantle. 
And I can't believe the dialogue between Mantle and Pepitone as well as you being in there because I know one thing. Uh, Joe Pepitone might have been the second uh, it American Italian, Italian American to play uh, in the in the major leagues, and uh, I mean, like Joe Pepitone was everything. I'll scratch that point. You know, there was Yogi Berra and everybody else, the Joe Garagiola. So I might be completely wrong, but I, I, I I'll, I'll tell you this: Joe Pepitone was the most flamboyant Italian ever to play in Major League Baseball. You had a relationship with Joe Pepitone as well as one of my heroes, Mickey Mantle. How was that? I tell you, it, it was like, for me, I mean, I was a fanatic baseball fan. Believe it or not, I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. So hating the Yankees growing up and transferring over when I became my my family and his family became close. His mom, they worked for my dad in a restaurant, and we became inseparable. I lived with him and Phil Lins. I mean, it was just incredible. And I, he would take me into the locker room. Yogi Rivera, I remember him asking Joe, you spell butt with two T's and Roger Maris standing in the corner, and there was Mickey and... What happened was Joe, I started going out with Joe, and Mickey Mantle loved Joe Pepitone and his hair dryer and his personality. I mean, he loved Joe. And the sad part was Mickey's brother and father died of a you know, dreadful disease, and Mickey would drink unbelievable because of that fear. He always had that in the back of his mind, and that's why it made him – I think the last icon you'll ever see in baseball to go out on the field and to do what he does. And I would sit right on the first baseline where Joe was playing and Mickey would run out to the field and then he'd stop at first base and wave to me and put his arm next to Joe's. And Joe had those skinny Italian arms and Mickey was all muscular and he was feeling Joe's arms and we just started laughing and kidding. And I want to tell you... My memories with Joe and Mickey Mantle probably surpass every every everyone else, every other memory, and I've had some good ones. Mickey was an icon. I mean, share one story uh, that uh, you might be able uh, to revisit. Uh, that uh, you were with Mickey Mantle? Could it be in a bar, which most likely a restaurant, even more so? But share one moment uh, that you'll never forget with the late Mickey Mantle. It was always, you know, we'd get a bite to eat in a bar restaurant, and we were at a bar, and uh, we were drinking and, uh, you know, having a good time. And, and I'm, I'm always saying to myself, you know, I, I, this was better than being on the Johnny Carson show. I always say to myself, I'm next to Mickey Mantle. And even when I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, transferred over, I mean, I would fight that Duke Snyder was better but Mickey Mantle was, was the greatest ever. And so we're at the bar, and he puts his arm around me, and he says, you know I love Joe Pepitone, and I'm getting to love you too. Well, I can't tell you, Felix. I, you know, I, I just can't forget something like that. Mickey Mantle, that would, that would just warm me uh, to no end. Um, the relationship between Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Uh, Roger Maris was the introvert. Mickey was the extrovert. Um, he would sit in the corner in the dugout or uh, sit at the end of the bench on the dugout, in the dugout or in the locker room, be removed from everybody. And I think New Yorkers were extremely unfair to Roger Maris because the co comparison between Mantle and Maris was never ending. Did Mickey Mantle ever talk about Roger Maris to you? I'm going to explain one thing to you. He never did. And another thing is that movie they put out, 61, with Maris and Mantle and going back. And forth, it was all false. That wasn't true. Rogers, uh, he sat right in the corner of one side of the locker room, Mickey on the other, and I never saw them really have any kind of conversation. 
Let me switch from Maris to Mantle. Negative about him either. Let me switch from Maris to Mantle to Sonny Corleone of The Godfather. You trained okay. for you trained for actor James Kahn. Uh, James Kahn is like a role model to most of us. We'll all remember his portrayal of uh, Brian Piccolo in Brian's song. Uh, which uh, Billy D. Williams, which could be like the second best sports movie of all time. Um, James that made me Con- cry. That movie. Oh, yeah, it made everybody cry, John. I mean, but... Yeah, only... and I lived with Jimmy Conn as well as trained him. So, we lived together. You, so you lived together in Los Angeles, no? Beverly Hills. Okay, so you guys met at U Hefner's Playboy Mansion, is that correct? No, no, no. Uh, my uncle managed Don Rickles. Okay. So he knew all of them. And that's how I get to be Jimmy and so many other stars. And during our friendship is when he took me to uh, you have this Playboy Mansion. And then as the story goes in the book, I got barred because I spent three hours with Bobby Ben. Now, wait a minute. Now, me. wait a minute. Hold on there. Hold on there, because you're going to glide over that. Really but this cool. was a great part of the book. You're invited to the Playboy Mansion. You strike up a, a conversation with Barbie Benton, who happens to be you Hefner's major squeeze and major girlfriend. You take a oh, walk. Oh, and oh. You take a walk. You take a walk and you sit and you talk with her for three hours. They're all looking for you. Hef's looking for his babe. James Kahn is looking for you. And all of a sudden, they realize that you and Barbie Benton are sitting on the bench back in the backyard of the Playboy Mansion. Is that how it went down? Back in the backyard like the woods. That's correct. And then once they found me, you have to call Jimmy. If something like this ever happens again, this guy, number one, I never want to see his face, and you'll never be allowed to come here. And Jimmy in the car is telling me, what are you, are you freaking nuts? What are you, crazy? You got this guy away, he's going to want to be my enemy, and I need him. How cheap was Don Rickles? Well, on the one to ten, probably nine and a half. And you actually trained the horse and named the horse Don Rickles, hoping that he might get interested. This was a good horse that you had as well, hoping that Don Rickles would get interested and then buy a horse and give you some more horses to train. Correct. And what, how it worked out was his, my naming a horse after him, even though he was too cheap and wouldn't put up any money with horses, uh, it led to other, other, you know, high-profile people. Let me ask you about this. Um, you came to Hollywood Park. I believe you were the leading trainer with 64 wins. For some reason, I can't remember you being a trainer here in California. But my friend Vince DeGregory, which he's family to you, which I love Vince like nobody else in this industry because I go back with him 45 years. And he is just an incredible individual. Um, what, year well, did you, what year did you Can co- I just tell you one thing? Yes. About Vince? Yes. This you would appreciate because you love horse racing. When... Vince looked after me, you know, from when I first started, and uh, and he was big time in the game. And when he had Pink Tie in California, we would sit at the cafeteria in Hollywood Park, and that's where we do his work. People would line up. In other words, there'd be twenty people online to get Pink Tie to where you know to uh, ride his horse, and at that time you were able to name your jock on like three, four, five different horses. And that's what Vince would do. <laughs> I would just shake my head. And Vince said, look, how many uh, times are you going to have Pink Tie? I have to take the best of it, and then I'll look and see and get opinions and which one of the four or five is the best horse, and that's where I'm going to go. 
And it, it was a great story, and I have so many great stories. Just interview, I just interviewed him and uh, spent a lot of time with him. Uh, he is uh, one of my closest allies in this game, and he's been for a lot of years. Veteran agent, veteran agent Vince DeGregory turned 87 uh, on August the 29th, and we sat there on a golf cart uh, just a week and a half ago uh, when Delmar was closing, closing in on their completion of their 30. And we sat down and I asked him a couple questions. I asked him, uh, how many Hall of Fame jockeys have you represented? And Vince started naming them. Uh, Cordero, Pinkai, uh, McCarran, uh, Solis, uh, DeSormo. Uh, just goes on and on. Jorge Velasquez. Um, Vince was always the dapper Dan, you know, when I was the DJ, again, going back to the nightclub scene, Vince used to come in with a sports jacket, with the tie clip and the clasp, um, with beautiful white shirt, looking as handsome as he's ever, ever, ever looked because uh, that was tough to do because he was one handsome guy no matter. When he came in, uh, he changed the whole complexion of, of, of the room, but when it he reminds you, Felix, of the guys that the way how they dressed in the twenties. Absolutely, I mean, but you Hard know, class. matter yeah. of fact, he would come in, and there would be a long bar. Um, I would be facing the bar. It would be about maybe forty-five, fifty, sixty feet, and I could see the bar. And there would be girls lined up at the bar, and uh, Vince would walk up, and he knew all the bartenders. And when he walked in, the first thing he would do is he'd look down the bar and say, Michael, set all these women up with a drink. And it, it was so common and so conditional uh, that uh, I could remember one night when I was DJing, a girl came down from the bar and she said, excuse me, Felix, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah. She says, is Vince coming in tonight? I said, well, you know, he's been in here every other night. I think so. You know, I think he'll probably be coming in here probably about 15 minutes. But I want to get back to your 64 win at Hollywood Park, uh, that was remarkable. Was that uh, your best year ever here in California? Uh, yes, it was. Who, yes, was, your it was. who, who uh, was your top horses? At that time, Lone Tree was, was the best. In fact, I'll give you a quick Lone Tree story. Uh, Shoemaker rode him, and, uh, he, you know, I, I gave him nothing but respect, and, I, he rode a horse for me at uh, Delmar, and uh, I had like $300 on me, and that's all I had. And uh, I, I got Shoemaker to ride the horse because Harry Silver, you know, Jimmy Kahn, everything like that, the connections. And I said, Mr. Shoemaker, it's an honor that you're riding, you know, this horse for me, and I think he'll win. And I'm betting so I only have $300. On, after that, I'm broke. So I'm betting that 300, and it means a lot to me. And so he rode the race, and he got stopped four times. Horse was much the best. And then when he came back, he looked at me, and I said to him, Mr. Shoemaker, there's always trouble at a cars and races, but this was an honor to have your name next to mine. So then the valet says to me, uh, Shoemaker wants you to come back uh and a half hour to the jocks room. And I went back there, and the ballot came out and gave me five $100 bills. Wow. Yeah, she was yeah. special. She, she, she was very – she used huh. to come in. She used to come in with uh, Donald Pierce and uh, Eddie Delahousse and uh, those guys. Burt Backrack. Oh, yeah. Bert. Matter of fact, I just ran into Burt Backrack at the track on closing day. Oh, what an incredible. Oh, how'd he look? How, how'd he look? Good? Yeah, you know, age is uh, caught up with all yeah, of us. And, you know, and he's uh, sort of slumped over a little bit. He's a bit. great guy. Great guy. And still, matter of fact, I interviewed Burt Backrack on the set of his show at Caesars Palace going back in the mid-'90s when he had Afternoon Delight. 
uh, running. He said, yeah, I'll give you an interview because we kicked off this radio program. My late partner, Ken Daniels, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I uh, came from California, and we put this uh, partnership together, and uh, I was out of Vegas, and so Bert was playing at Caesars Palace, and he had Afternoon Delights trained by uh, Richard Mandela, and he said, sure, I'll give you an interview, but you'll have to come after my show on Saturday night at Caesars Palace, and that's exactly what I did. You know, Facebook and social media has really brought us completely together, and we're able to. And I have a dear friend down in Ocala, Florida. Her name is Susanna Pascuma, which Tommy is her father. No, no. And Tommy no, was wow. Tommy was your assistant. That was with. Yep, and not only that. My best horse was that seven track record, simply majestic. I love that horse. Tommy was assist yeah, he was assistant to me at the time and he got him to drink a, a little beer. <laughs> I hope Peter's not listening, but he didn't drink a lot just to sip. <laughs> Tommy was a great and I got to know uh, please give him my love. Oh. God, yeah, Susanna is, if Susanna is very, very, very special lady, and she kept on telling me when I put it out there because I put your book out there uh, that you were going to be that you were going to be a guest. Are you still there? All right. Yes. All right. Just, we just that uh, we just uh, had a had a drop there. Probably one of the lines here. Uh, you're listening to track talk. No, the cat jumped on me. What's that? The cat jumped on me. <laughs> hey, well, I told you. I told you, make sure that there's nobody else around because you never know what happens. You're right. I thought it was nobody. I forgot the cat. All righty. No problem at all. Uh, John Paracella joining us. I'm Felix Taverna, produced by Way Taylor. This is Track Talk. Uh, Tommy D's on the road again because he's got a busy day. We got the second big week of college football. If you're just tuning into the radio program, Antonio Brown has been released by the Oakland Raiders. And I've said it all along that this was not a match made in heaven. But one that has been is the trainer to the stars from the streets of Brooklyn. We are visiting with trainer, former trainer, but he probably could get back into it right now. John Paracella, a lifetime of celebrity connections. How'd you meet Bono from U2? Uh, that really uh, intrigued me when I read about that. Uh, he used or he sort of allowed the connection between you and your uncle, who was the manager of Don Rickles, to meet Frank Sinatra, the chairman of the board. How'd you meet Bono? Well, the truth of the matter is, we went to the uh, benefit together. My uncle was responsible for that. But uh, U2's road manager was a degenerate horse player. And so I was giving him horses to bet on. <laughs> and he was living out in California. So one day I get a phone call that they were appearing at Thomas Mack Stadium. And uh, Sinatra's having a benefit. And Don Rickles is the opening act. And, you know, big stars, Roger Moore, everybody was there. So he told me, he said, listen, Bono's favorite singer is Frank Sinatra. And I said to myself, wow, you know what I'm saying? I am a big fan of that, but I, I never connected how, how the two could connect. And he said, is it possible in any way for Bono to meet Frank Sinatra? So I went to my uncle and... Uh, at that time, once again, Bethany was with me uh, in Las Vegas because I was out there and wanted to go out there for the show and everything. And I said to my uncle, can you pull this off? I said, this is one of the biggest groups of all time, you know, and we'll be. And he said, okay, let's do it. And so I got them where they had paid. It was $25,000 a head for this benefit. And the whole group I got in. And, you know, I didn't have to pay anything. And then, uh, in fact, Frank Sinatra said, uh, I'm supposed to introduce you two. And the only thing I know about that is that it's a boat. So <laughs> that was his opening remarks introducing the band. And then uh, we went backstage. And uh, Sinatra, my uncle was going to bring Sinatra out of the dressing room. I didn't bring him in the dressing room. We were outside the dressing room. 
And uh, that's how it was supposed to happen. As it turned out, Sam Giancana was in the dressing room, and we couldn't get Sinatra out, and Bono was waiting there for over an hour. So finally, a fifth time, I begged my uncle, and Sinatra came out, and they really hit it off. And I don't know how long later they did uh, Come Rain and Come Shine on Frank Sinatra's first duet album. So I put them together, and I, I, said, I said, wow, a kid from Brooklyn putting Sinatra and Bono together, that's pretty cool. Without question. I mean, uh, the, some of the people now, the, some of the people that you, you, were, you were hanging around with, you know, like, uh, you know, you had juice. And so I'm sure there was some uh, mafia uh, big time members that uh, you might have been in your circle because Vegas at that time was all run by the mob. That's no secret. And uh, I know Sam Giacano was a part of one of those events. I think it was the U two in Chicago, and, right? Yeah, and so like uh, he was a he was a he was a big time guy. Uh, you had a problem with Steve Wynn because I guess you got Steve Wynn and. His daughter and Bethany into the U2 concert or whatever concert it was or got them to meet a Bono from U2? No, it was the U2 concert, and I brought them backstage. He couldn't get he couldn't get his daughter in to see Bono and to see, you know, or to sit up front. And so... Uh, was that before he owned... To... Was that before he owned casinos in Vegas, or...? No, no. It's when he owned the casino... He owned, uh, what was the first one he owned? The Golden Felix, Nugget. Uh, the Golden no, Nugget? No, it was one after that. The Mirage? It was the one after that. The Mirage. Mirage, that's the right. Mirage. Yes. He owned the Mirage at the time. In fact, that's where I introduced Patino to Steve Wynn at the Mirage as well. And uh, he, I got his daughter backstage, and I never got a thank you from him. Amazing, amazing. And, 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 and he just know, wasn't my kind of guy. And then even when I put him together with Patino, nothing, you know, he, he just just wasn't my kind of guy. I, you know, you just, uh, I, I don't deal with saying anything negative about somebody, but I like saying he's not my kind of guy that I want to hang out with. Well, you know, my friend and my very, very best friend was, as I shared with you earlier in the week, was Jerry Tarkanian. And Jerry said to me the same thing. He said, you know, I, I, I could bond with a lot of people, but this Steve Wynn guy, I just don't feel him. I just can't get close to him. Uh, right. Maybe that's the way it is. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. You sure. were responsible for Rick Pitino taking the Kentucky job. Correct. How did that happen? Well, when he was having a problem with the Knicks, Shug McGay, he who just won the, I was so happy for him, we just won the Travis, uh, called me called me into his office and said, Seth Hancock and a, the biggest booster, and Hi Hancock and his booster played Jim Rummy 10,000 a game, want to know, at that time they were on probation, if I could get Rick, if he leaves the Knicks, to coach Kentucky. So I said, wow, that's a tall order, but uh, Al Bianchi told me that John Rick is gone, so I will talk to him. So I know that for a fact, but you're saying that he won't be coaching the Knicks because uh, Al Bianchi, who's a friend of yours as well, let me know that uh, he had to go. You know what I mean? And uh, I had to promise Al, because he told me that, that when – and a job offer was on the table, and he was going to take it. I was going. To, I would have to tell Al that there was a job in effect. And so uh, I spoke to Rick about it, and he said, uh, "Okay, it's Kentucky suspension, but they had a mecca of basketball." All right, you know, I'll talk to. Uh, uh, oh no! In fact, you will have to have Cam Newton come to my house. And at that time, uh, he was living upstate. You mean C.M. Uh, Newton? You mean C.M. Well, Newton, right? Yeah, C.M. Newton. He was the and and tell me that they really want me. C. Rick Newton. was that way. He, yeah, C Rick was that way. As great 
I think he's the greatest, one of the greatest college coaches of all time. And but he was insecure, so he needed to be told he was wanted, especially after what he was going through with the Knicks. Well, let me tell so you Sam about Newton this. Let me let house. me say this about the Knicks job, okay? El Bianchi hired Rick Pitino to be the head basketball coach of the Knicks, correct? No, actually, uh, Al didn't. He, he was the antithesis of what Al believed, you know, with pressing the ball from coming out and everything like that. He was old school. Uh, he was hired by uh, um, who was uh, who owned the Knicks at the time? Uh, Golf and Western. Golf Western. That's, that's right. Really, was instrumental. In hiring him. And Al and Rick, I, thank God I was there as a liaison because they had two complete different schools of thought. Yeah, they sure had. There's no question about and, that. Uh, and they still yep, don't. And like I said. They still don't like each other. Love them. No, and loving both guys. That's you know, Al, I'll I tell you what Al did. Patino's wife was a princess. And when Rick gave me his seats, she told him, I want those seats next year to go to my brother. And so Rick had to take the seats away from me. You know, naturally, I was sitting right next to the court. And Al Bianchi said to me, I heard what happened with Rick. I'm giving you my seat. How's that? Al was, Al, you know, I known Al for a long period of time. And I remember when Al was... Uh, the assistant coach to the Phoenix Phoenix Suns for many years. I worked for the Clippers during the Sterling years here in San Diego, which was short-lived. And I got to become very, very good friends with El Bianchi. And I had the opportunity to meet Rick Pitino over the last couple of years. One of the, the main reasons why I like Rick Pitino so much is because how he treated Jerry Tarkanian when they both got inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame with the same class. And Tark came back, and Tark was very failing, and Tark wanted more than anything before he passed to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And his presenter was uh, Bill Walton, but uh, one of the fond pictures I have is between Rick Pitino. Oh, that's great. Rick Pitino and, and Bill Walton uh, both entering the Hall of Fame in the same year. You've had horses with a lot of interesting. Rick Pitino, by the way, is a godfather for my daughter. Yes, I know that, and I and that says that book. Hey, let me talk about the book. Where can the book? The book is a very, very solid, well written. Now, Denny Dressman, if you're listening to this radio program, um, for you, first of all, John, for your memory going back, I give you. Ten stars plus. I mean, you can't get any better than that. Just for uh, reliving some of these stories, which is absolutely, I don't know how you do it. But just uh, trainer to the stars, how can they get the book? It's written uh, by Denny Dressman, as mentioned. Hit hit the marks, hit the mark books, uh, dot com is where uh, you can find it. Uh, George Steinbrenner. Hugh Hefner, Angel Cordero, Bill Shoemaker, Joe Pepitone, James Kahn, Mickey Mantle. You have all kinds of stories. What are you doing right how now? How about uh, Howard Stern? How about Howard Stern? Tell us about him. Put him in the same category as Steve Wynn. Really? Yes. Not, not your kind of guy? Uh, no. In fact, I needed to sell my house. He bought my house in Old Westbury, New York, and he was so obnoxious and arrogant. I almost walked. I did walk out of the room, which would have been the dumbest thing I did in my life. But uh, no, he's, he's in Steve Wynn's category. He's, he's much too arrogant. And in fact, this is funny. Uh, it brings back a memory. There was an, a special airline that went out of business, and I went with Al Bianchi. Uh, we went on a trip somewhere, and who's on the same plane as Howard Stern? And did you have a conversation with him? No, of course, I didn't like him. All I said to him was, this is unfortunate that this, I'm a straightforward guy. This is unfortunate that we're on the same plane, but let's not acknowledge each other. And on that same plane, there was a guy there with a beautiful woman, and I Probably, I, you know, 
women were my demise, I probably maybe flirted a little bit. So the guy got up to come at me. And Al Bianchi, sitting next to me, says to him, you better for your own good sit down. The guy sat down. How's that story? Yeah, Al, you know, Al, I can remember Al throwing Al. the clipboard at one of the officials, and uh, the official came over, and uh, uh, Al, Al, was, uh, Al was such a tough guy, you know. Uh, he was the head coach of the Virginia Squires. They were the first uh, ABA champs. Uh, and uh, Al, you know, was at Seattle. He's been around and uh, uh, just a, a, a great, great, great guy. What's been your one big takeaway? We got about four minutes. If you could do one thing over again through your illustrious career, once again, we're talking with John Paracella, trainer to the stars from the streets of Brooklyn. I want to say hello to Frank Vento, who's listening to our radio program uh, in Aurora, Colorado. Thanks, John, or Frank, for setting this up. John Paracella, uh, Lifetime Celebrity Connection. Susanna down in Ocala, Florida. Norman up there in North San Diego County, uh, logged on. Uh, what's been, if you could do one more thing, what would it be? The one more thing that I would do would be uh, win the Kentucky know, Derby. Would you, you like? Know, I, I hate between uh, winning the Derby or winning the Belmont and listening to Frank Sinatra. Really? So let's say one of those. Yeah. Was Sinatra? Sinatra was a little rough at the edges, though, wasn't he? Big, big time. I was in his company six times, and the only good thing he ever really said to me: "Us Italians have to stick together." But he was re he was really rough around the edges. Uh, you know, just being in his company, you know, my mother, my aunt, Frank Sinatra was the greatest, you know, and just being in his company was, uh, let's face it, he was an icon, and probably him and Elvis Presley are my two all-time favorites. Yeah. Would you say? Say it one more time. But rough around the edges. Bro. Yeah. Really. Yep. You know, but Frank, uh, you know, um, Frank was very good to UNLV in the, in the basketball program there. And Tark told me that Frank would come in and do a concert and raise about a million dollars for UNLV basketball. Wow. I didn't know that. And um, the, one of the great stories that Jerry Tarkanian shared with me about Frank Sinatra, he said uh, that they were picking him up. Uh, at the airport, he was playing at the dunes. And so they picked him up at the airport and uh, the pawn getting out of the car and checking into the hotel, the bellman came up and, you know, took Frank's luggage and, and Frank looked at the bellman and said, uh, hey, uh, by the way, just for curiosity's sake, uh, what's the biggest tip you ever had? And uh, the bellman said, $100. And Frank says, oh, well, that's nice. He goes, here, here's 200 for you. And the bellman starts walking hey, away. He was, he was generous. And, and Frank Frank turned around. Frank turned around and said, hey, uh, by the way, uh, who was the guy that tipped you $100? And the bellman said, that was you, Mr. Sinatra. Okay, Sinatra was a great <laughs> tipper. He was, was a great tipper. Tark told me so many great stories about Vegas. but Yeah, that was a good side to him. Yep, and you were, you know, you you were a part of it. So, what are you doing right now? And you know, or do you have any plans on coming back and training again? Well, if the right person came along, I'd like to do it in California. Believe it or not, my daughter's there. I just had my granddaughter, and she was born two months ago. And I would go if the right person in California, I would. Right now, I have a big client. I'm a consultant for him, and. I'm watching every race at all different tracks. I've watched every race at Del Mar, every race Saratoga, and you know I've watched Kentucky Downs all over. And uh, the one thing I, I take most pride in is Kentucky people, uh, like uh, the people, and against they had a little aversion to Italians in New York and everything. And when I went there and broke the record. I tell you, I was on cloud nine, and I think that was my best accomplishment because I only had six horses, and Lucas had 100, and I beat him. 
John, we got to fly. We're out of here on a Saturday. I could tell you that it's been a pleasure having you on the radio program. I would be lying. It's not been a pleasure. It's been an ultra extreme pleasure of reading your book, having a conversation with you earlier in the week and talking with you. We're going to do this again, part two, with John Paracella. Trainer to the stars from the streets of Brooklyn. John Paracella's Lifetime and Celebrity Connections. I want to thank Frank Vento, Wade Taylor, John Paracella. I'm Felix Taverna. We'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Kenja Dixon was crowned the number one sales executive through hard work, deep thinking, and the revelation of universal talk laws. He now wants to share these lessons with you. Universal talk laws are what you need to know and use in business and at home to have successful and effective conversations. Kenja Dixon shares his wisdom, action plans, and wealth. Each book comes with a chance to win $10,000. Find universal talk laws at KenjaDixon.com. I've heard this is like one of the best pizza spots in town. Yes, it is. I'll do a slice of pepperoni, slice of vegetarian. You got it. And I will pay for all of that in three days. In three days? <laughs> What's that mean? Well, wait, you accept credit cards. That money's not going to hit your account for three days anyway. I need my money quicker. At Chase, we hear you. With Express Funding, card payments are in your Chase account the next business day. Go to chase.com slash express funding. Chase for business, so you can. Compensated participation, all businesses are subject to credit approval. Not all clients are eligible for next business day funding and additional terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. Hey, it's Catherine from Listen Local Radio. Moe's Guitars has proudly served the San Diego music community since 1975. Specializing in guitars, basses, mandolins, banjos, and ukuleles, they buy, sell, trade, and consign. If you're looking for lessons, repairs, accessories, and cool gear, you've found the right place. Located in downtown La Mesa Village, stop by and check out their digs or visit moesguitars.com or their Facebook page. M-O-Z-E guitars.com. 619-698-1185. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Too much to do? Not enough time to get it done? Call on the experts at Another 8 Hours for your business support needs. By partnering with Another 8 Hours, we allow you to focus on the more important matters, like being in front of your clients, doing what you do best, rather than being stuck at a desk pouring over paperwork, rummaging through emails, returning phone calls, and struggling to get everything done by yourself. Meanwhile, your family and social life are going down the drain. Go to Another8Hours.com or call 8 More Hours. That's 866-734-6877. Life is full of misadventures, from car crashes to home fires to getting choked out on the mat. Yes, I said getting choked out because I'm Carlos Kramer, jiu-jitsu competitor, MMA and media personality, and mild-mannered insurance agent. You can follow my adventures on Kick-Ass Radio, and I can protect you from life's misadventures at Kramer Insurance. Home, auto, life, business, and workers' comp, we're at KramerINS.com, and I want you to join my world.